Perfect. Afternoon. How are we doing? Had a good, good lunch? This is the hardest session now because everyone starts going, you know, I'm a bit tired. Uh, yeah, I'm Max Vetter. I'm from uh, Immersive Labs talking to you about threat intelligence and criminal innovation. A uh, bit of my background, I, um, out of uni, I joined a private sector investigation firm. Uh, we did a lot of kind of internet investigations and open source intelligence. And then uh, joined the Met Police as well. And so was part of the SCD6 money laundering unit and e-crime unit. And then uh, joined the training company, training uh, the GCHQ summer school as well. So as part of that, um, my, the CEO of Immersive Labs had quite a similar background as well. He, I, I met him at part, uh, training the GCHQ summer school. And part of that, he, he kind of realized when we were training them that the, the way that the training we were delivering wasn't quite right for the people that we were delivering it to. Uh, so he left and set up Immersive Labs. And I'll give you a bit, a bit of background to Immersive Labs in a second. But I'll just give an overview of what we're going to talk about. So yeah, I'll, I'll just show you what Immersive Labs is if you haven't, haven't heard of it before. And then I'll talk about criminal innovation because really my... Uh, last 15 years of my research has, has mostly been about criminal innovation. If anyone's here for cyber, which most of us are, uh, that's what it's all about. If there was no criminal innovation, then we'd be fine or I'd be out of a job and you know we could uh, go and do other things in our lives. Uh, but because criminals keep innovating, uh, that's why we have a problem with cyber. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about the dark web and Silk Road and a bit about Bitcoin as well, because those are kind of three things that are the, the epitome really of criminal innovation and, and how criminals have utilized really good technologies uh, for kind of nefarious means. And then I'll talk about cyber threat intelligence. So this is really trying to get the time down between uh, the time that the hacker finds that vulnerability and utilizes it and um, when we can actually stop them. So, you know, what cyber threat intelligence is about collecting as much intelligence that's out there and trying to stop the bad guys as, as fast as possible, because really they, they always have the, the lead on this. And that's that's the whole point. And then I'll talk about intelligence-led training. So, so what we're doing at Immersive Labs now is uh, moving more towards uh, reactive uh, learning based on the cyber threat intelligence as well, which is, which is quite an interesting bit. And we're, we're kind of um, doing that all to MITRE ATT&CK framework. If you haven't heard of MITRE ATT&CK, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that as well. So yeah, Immersive Labs uh, was set up early 2017. Um, about a year ago, we had 10 people. Now we've got 80, so we're kind of moving pretty fast. Uh, and what, what it is, is basically over 500 different exercises on everything from what is cyber all the way up to an eight-hour reverse engineering, uh, reverse engineering malware kind of lab and everything in between from ethical hacking and digital forensics and instant response uh, and everything else like that. So what you do, you just log into the platform. There's no kind of classroom training or anything uh, and teach yourself uh, different parts of, of the cyber kind of workforce. Um, so that's that's a bit of background to Immersive Labs. When it comes to criminal innovation, this is the whole point, isn't it? That if a criminal can rapidly innovate, they will always have first mover advantage. And there's there's occasions when, like uh, with the NHS, maybe they should have patched a few months earlier, uh, things like that. And there are reasons for that uh, where you know, they should have moved faster. But this is the whole point, is that criminals will always find those zero-day vulnerabilities, and they'll always uh, get there first and make the money as fast as possible or, or whatever they want to do with it, whether it's making money or stealing information and everything. Uh, we're always playing catch-up, whether in the police or the business, and we just got to accept that. That is just a fact of life, and that will always be the case. Uh, but it's how we break, bring that time right down to as, as little as possible so we can actually, uh, you know, do it before they take another hospital down or maybe a plane or a train or anything else. Um, so the dark web is quite a good example of particular criminal innovation. Who's been on the dark web? So you can, you can, it's not illegal. It depends what you do on there. Uh, that'll make it illegal or not. Uh, I'm not a police officer anymore, so it's okay. You can, you can, you can say it. Uh, so the dark web, as we, there's a few different dark webs, but the one I'm going to talk about is, is the Tor dark web. Uh, Tor was developed by the US Navy, uh, to secure intelligence communications. So that was really why they first developed Tor, because at the time they couldn't, um, you couldn't go online anonymously. Uh, they couldn't actually do their investigations into terrorists and everything else uh, and be anonymous. So they developed something called uh, the Onion Router Tor, which is basically a browser that allows you to bounce your IP address through a few different proxy servers. Actually, I've got a picture here. Um, 
and allow you to have anonymity. So this is if Alice wants to uh, go online anonymously. Now, she could be a human rights activist. She could be uh, from the Naval Research Laboratory, or she could be a terrorist or a paedophile as well. She wants to go online anonymously for various different reasons. Uh, so she downloads Tor and connects to it. And what it does is it will connect through three proxy servers to the end website here. So Alice is the user. Bob is the website she wants to visit. Good thing about here is Bob will only see the IP address to the, the final, IP, um, final node. And there are about 7,000 nodes in the Tor network, so they're all uh, run by volunteers. And so even if they're captured by a, a well-known intelligence agency, uh, <laughs> they, if they're looking at what the data's doing, they will only, if they capture the first one, they'll only see Alice in the second. If they capture the second, they'll only see the first and the third. If they capture the third, they'll only see the second and Bob. So that's why there's three. So you can, no one can see the whole, the whole network. The other thing to try and stop people looking at what you're doing is they switch every 10 minutes as well. Every new website you go to is a whole new circuit. Every 10 minutes it switches to a whole new circuit as well. Uh, so quite a clever system for getting around that annoying thing that you can't be anonymous online. So what had happened then is the, the Tor project was, and, and you can go on their, their website called torproject.org, I think, uh, their mission statement is something like to protect human rights around the world using technology, uh, privacy technology. And so that's their, and I, I believe that's what they kind of intend is to protect human rights. So they, they set it up for places like India, uh, not India necessarily, maybe, uh, Iran or India uh, or uh, China, where maybe there's not so, much, so good human rights. Uh, to allow people to be anonymous online. What they also then developed was something called Tor Hidden Services. The Tor Hidden Services is where you can actually place, so Bob can place his website within the Tor network. And there, I won't go into it in detail, but there's six hops, basically. So there's three hops from the user, three hops from the website. So the user and the website can interact without either knowing the other one's IP address. Pretty clever system for getting around the whole the fact that online you need to give your IP address over and that identifies you a lot of the time. So quite useful, again, if you're in China or uh, Iran and you want to run a website about human rights. So that will protect you from being found by those authorities, but also it will protect you if you're doing something dodgy. So this is the you know classic criminal innovation is, it turns out there's a lot more people doing dodgy things than human rights activists. Uh, so out of the Five or six thousand websites on the dark web. They they found about fifty two percent of them are uh, doing illegal things. Uh, other things, there's other ones that are just cat blogs and ridiculous stuff like the normal normal internet. Um, so, and one of them particularly that put kind of the dark web on the map was the Silk Road. Uh, everyone heard of Silk Road? So this kind of was really it, it got taken down in 2013. Basically, eBay for drugs. So these are, well, you can see what drugs they're selling. Uh, there's 11,867 types of drugs. I took this screenshot about a week before it got, it got seized. Uh, and yeah, lots of, lots of drugs on sale. When it got seized, this really kind of put the dark web on the map. No one really heard of the dark web. I, I was giving similar talks at, at the time, and I actually was giving a talk the same day. So I had to change my slides to, to bring up uh, this, uh, <laughs> showing that it had actually been seized. Now, there was a guy running it. This guy is called Ross Albrecht. Uh, and so again, he, you can talk about why he did it. He, his, his, there's, there's lots of fil uh, films out there about that called, uh, Deep Web is one of them, uh, about why he did it. And he, his idea was to kind of stop all the harm from drugs, uh, which is quite interesting. Or that's what people say he did. So he hated the fact that it was organized criminals and everything else. And he's like, well, if everyone buys it online, then you're not having those, uh, bad players in between. Now, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying that's, that's his, his reason for doing it. Um, but his OPSEC wasn't so good. And obviously the US, uh, and here, uh, we, drugs are not legal yet. Uh, so they didn't like the fact that I think a congressman got to hear about, uh, Silk Road and he said, well, let's put a, a task force on that. Uh, there's a number of reasons, uh, a number of ways they found it. One of them was that he wasn't so good with his, his OPSEC. And the problem with criminals is, they have to live in the real world and they have to deal with the real world the whole time. So this is a magic mushroom uh, uh, forum. And what the investigators did, the first thing they did was look for the very first time anyone mentioned the Silk Road on the dark web anywhere online. 
and they found this this forum for magic mushrooms. And what this forum said, there's a guy called Altoids basically advertising the Silk Road. He's going, oh, I found this drugs website. It's really good. Go and, go and have a look. Uh, then there's another website where an IT pro needed for a venture-backed Bitcoin startup. And again, this is Altoid talking. Uh, sorry if there's another thread for this. He basically needs someone to help him with his startup. Uh, and please contact me at rossalbricks at gmail.com. Now, his, uh, his Bitcoin startup was, uh, was the Silk Road, obviously. Uh, they made about $1.2 billion in sales in two years, so pretty good startup. That's actually a unicorn, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it didn't go so well for Ross. Uh, and he's now got about 230 years in jail because uh, they did find him from, from this and, and other things. They found the servers there in uh, Iceland. And then even more. So this is, again, Altoy talking about and help with Bitcoin development. So it wasn't that good with Bitcoin. Uh, and so this is Altoy again. And part of that, he basically, basically cut and pasted the code he was having issues with. And that included his Bitcoin address. And so what you can actually do, <laughs> and this, you can see the date there, it's 2011. So this is three, uh, two years before it even got seized. So all this, the point of all this is all that threat intelligence is out there. You just gotta, you just gotta find it somewhere. Um, and what you can do now, you can go and find this forum. You can go and look on the blockchain because it's all publicly accessible. And that's what criminals are now realizing is that no, it's not anonymous and you can actually just track every payment ever. And, they're all getting a bit hot under the color because um, what you can do, you can then trace, just trace all the payments through to this address, <coughs> which had 111,000 Bitcoin in it. So this was the cold address, the cold wallet address for the Silk Road, uh, which the FBI seized and um, then sold eventually uh, back to the market. So <laughs> the, uh, the kind of lesson of that story is, yeah, criminals will in always innovate, but with kind of threat intelligence and, and if we gather that intelligence properly, then uh, you know, we'll all be playing, be playing catch up, but they only need to get it wrong once, right? So, so it's always that kind of um, thing between between those. So, cyber threat intelligence, continual change, speed of awareness, and you need to stay up to date. So, this is the problem: is how do you actually stay up to date with this stuff? Um, these are from our platform. So, these are uh, some different ransomware um, malware samples that we have within the Immersive Labs platform. Want to cry there particularly, we got that within our platform in five, hour, five hours after it hit uh, NHS. We took a, a copy of it, put it on our platform, um, and particularly the, the police we're working with really, really liked that because they actually had to send people out to the hospitals to get a copy of uh, Want to Cry to analyze it. So you can go and have a look at that. This one's a Stalin locker, which is, which is quite funny. When it, when